All right, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Kyle Campos. I am the Enterprise DevOps and Platform Leader at CSA Insurance. Uh, we are a 100-year-old company uh, insurance provider for AAA. Um, I am a frustrated but hopeful uh, cloud leader inside of a large enterprise. Um, our, uh, our journey inside of Cloud Foundry actually came out of the frustration of change management to a large degree, right? It's, it was extremely painful uh, to get infrastructure. It was extremely painful once you had that infrastructure to get your code on it. Um, so really it was a engineering revolt that kind of started Cloud Foundry at CSAA um, that, that got it in there. Um, so I know we're, we will all have different uh, experiences with ITSM. Um, some of the, I, these are obviously going to be my experiences. I know they're to a large degree shared experiences. Uh, some of the details might you might have optimized some areas where where we haven't, and that's and that's great. Um, but hopefully, at the end of this, we can see like we have uh, different delivery models and where we can align. We should. Uh, where we can um, optimize one or the other, we should. But at the end of the goal, I'm here to talk about uh, injecting uh, value around fast delivery and sort of inverting that risk, speed, uh, uh, fear that currently exists in large enterprises around ITSM. So when I, when I and I set some definitions too, when I refer to our legacy ops environment, uh, that is a very, uh, low levels of automation, low to none, um, and extremely high levels of control. So friction everywhere at every turn, right? So I can start with, uh, I'm focusing on change management for ITSM. So if I, if I pull up the ITIL definition, the goal of change management process is to ensure that standardized methods and procedures are used for efficient and prompt handling of all changes in order to minimize the impact change-related incidents upon service quality and consequently improve the day-to-day -day operations of the organization. So just definition-wise, I'm like, I'm aligned. I'm, I'm with you. Like, those outcomes sound great, and, and, and uh, we're in full alignment. The trick is when you extract those words efficient and prompt, um, I look at what's happening in our legacy ops stack. I look at what's happening in our cloud foundry stack, and you can't help but think, that those words mean entirely different things to each side of that organization, right? Um, so we have to kind of tear that back a little bit and say, okay, well, what are the, what are the um, uh, attributes of those methods and procedures in the legacy ops stack versus Cloud Foundry uh, continuous delivery stack? So what I've found is in the, ITSM world, it's, it's the methods and procedures are traditionally expressed through documentation primarily, right? The ownership is through governance boards, uh, quite large ones depending on size of your enterprise. And the focus tends to be lowest common denominator or slowest common denominator, right? It has to account for everything, right? So whatever crazy, app, you know, some app team did something 20 years ago and it's, you know, insanely complex, the process has to bend to that, right? It's measured by compliance, right? It, 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 that's kind of its primary focus. Just as long as you do what we say, you're good, right? Um, and some of the smells here, if you're like, I'm, I think I'm in that world. Um, uh, accountability is more highly valued than determinism, right? So as long as they, at any point in the process, they feel like there's somebody accountable for that, it doesn't matter in what form they bring that accountability, just as long as they have a name or, or a team, uh, that's all that matters. And I'm not saying accountability doesn't matter, I'm just saying that it tends to matter the most here. Um, over time, delivery slows just by nature, right, as, as they as more teams come into the process, as you, as you get more applications, uh, governance boards increase, processes increase. So meetings and human touch point uh, tend to increase over time. In 
continuous delivery models, the methods and procedures tend to be expressed through code, right? Or they should be expressed through code. The ownership should be in the delivery team's hands. The focus should be acceleration, and you measure it by performance, right? Uh, some of the fruits that start to come out here is that determinism is more important than accountability, right? So how you get to that decision is more important than like who's the name, who can I blame if it goes wrong? Um, I don't, if, if you, if I assume most of you have experience in this, in this, in this world, uh, you'll know that um, it's a lot of the decisions, approvals are left up to people's whims. They've never, they have no idea what this change is about but they will be accountable because they hit the approve button, right? So here, we want to inject determinism into uh, how we deliver software. And over time, the delivery should get faster, right? If the focus is acceleration, we're always looking to optimize speed. Um, and then pipelines increase and human touch point decreases over time. So that when, you, when you're continuously delivering anywhere a human comes into contact with it, sticks out like a sore thumb, right? And it's a, it's a target to, for optimization. Uh, if we take the same approach here, old and new against efficient and prompt, what are some of the uh, characteristics here? So efficiency, the aim tends to be in, in process refinements. Like that's how you squeeze out efficiency in ITSM. Like, okay, we had five drop downs on this, on this first uh, 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 ticket, maybe we'd take it down to four, you know. That's, that's primarily where the process uh, refinements come in. And then the vehicle is training, right? Get people into more training, let them learn the new processes. It's measured by traceability, is there, are there breadcrumbs at every step? Uh, the smells here is, is traceability first. Just as long as you know what happened, is tends to be good enough for efficiency's sake. Um, and then what you you run into is that the process, it gets gamed to gain efficiency, right? So people naturally feel frustrated that their change isn't getting through in, in time. And there's all sorts of uh, crafty methods people game that system by, whether it's how you get a change approved, whether it's how many changes you shove into some approval form, right? You're like, okay, well, if I do one request with 50 things and then I'm gonna get that through faster than I can if I, I had you know, 50 different releases. Um, there's a very high tolerance towards wasted effort, right? Um, I've, I've been in deployment meetings with literally 100 people on the phone, and nobody is embarrassed by that. <laughs> and, and I'm embarrassed that nobody's embarrassed. And like, we should all be shocked right now <laughs> that this is what it's taking. Um, and it creates specialized workforces, right? So there's teams that exist solely to help people navigate that complexity, right? Uh, in the new model, the aim is higher quality on time software, um, full stop. Our vehicle to get there is through automation. We measure it by delivery KPIs. And repeatability first is one of the main fruits, right? It isn't just get it through at all costs and then we celebrate. It's is what you've done repeatable. Um, and then namely through, through pipelining, right? Uh, the pipeline in this case is the most efficient way to get it to prod. So whereas in ITSM, you're frequently gaming it to get things going faster, in continuous delivery, your pipeline is the best way to get there, right? There's no faster way to get it into prod, or better way, I should say, faster and better. There might be a faster way, but not a safer way. <laughs> um, and in, this, in, in, in the pipeline world, there's really low tolerance for wasted effort, right? Um, where you see it, it sticks out, and you attack it. And there's team ownership on these pipelines because it is a, it's a cross-functional pipeline, right? You're taking it from an engineer's hands and laptop into production, and there's a, depending on your gates and all the quality and security and performance stuff you have to do, there's a lot of people that are contributing to that pipeline, and they have to feel a sense of ownership over it. They, should, they have their own KPIs for their, their boxes along that pipeline and how, and how efficient they run. All right, the illusion. So here's some of the uh, illusions we fall under in, inside of ITSM. You get the sense that there's safety and complexity, right? There's this feeling like the harder we make this process, the more people that are involved, the more steps that are involved, it must be injecting safety because 
well, there's just so many checkpoints, right? But most of those, or many of them, tend to be arbitrary. Uh, they're non-deterministic. Um, so it, it's, it's, it's uh, uh, mostly, in, in many cases, a facade. Uh, another illusion is that approval is the same thing as accountability. Um, I have conversations probably every week with some other vice president who says, I just keep clicking approve on these things, I have no idea what they are, <laughs> right? And they're frustrated and they, they want a, a, somebody else on their team to just keep clicking approve. Um, so approval really, at the end of the day, when you look at changes, there may be one person there that had any idea in that chain of what this change was. The other illusion, and it's sort of this false dichotomy that gets set up uh, on the ITSM side, right, is that if you're going fast, it must be reckless. So I'm here to talk on an, uh, uh, a third way that is fast and not reckless, fast and safe. Um, the way I kind of explain this landscape uh, for getting uh, software into production is this, you know, this, this dangerous road off in, the, off in the horizon there, if we imagine off in the valley, is where we're gonna start with a code commit and up here, our heavenly production on the top of them. We ascend the mountain. So many turns, right? We start with a code commit uh, and then our first sort of junction point if we're being uh, good stewards here is that you have some measure of testing that's gonna happen, right? And after that, you gotta make another turn at process. You gotta make a change request with whatever that artifact is and whatever the, the change logs are. And then that's gotta go through some set of approvals, however many it takes to get through your organization. Then you gotta open up a change window. When's this gonna happen, right? And then you do the change, and then you gotta wrangle another group of people that are gonna come back around and validate the change and say everything went right. You didn't break you know, the 60 other teams in your, in your company. This is a very generous view. I'm gonna, I, I'm, I'm gonna say, we'll, we'll, we'll say success at that point. That's a very generous uh, amount of steps there. Um, but congrats, you got it into one environment, right? Okay, now go ahead and repeat all of that for your test environments. You're gonna have to cr cross the bridge of real data, which is always a harrowing, harrowing effort. Um, however many pre-prod environments you may have, and then eventually you get it into production, right? And so ITSM overlords will kind of show these huge process maps and say like, yeah, that's it. By the way, you have, to, you have to drive that road with like the junkiest beat up old car that you're gonna hate. It's really uncomfortable and annoying. Um, and you start complaining enough about that and they're like, okay, we'll, we'll optimize a little bit. And then they're like, we got a, a newer car for you to take all the same turns. You got to do all the same process bits, right? Nothing is substantively changed with the process. You might, maybe you're a little more comfortable. We took a few radio buttons away. The approval list is from 30 to 25, whatever it may be, right? And then we come along with Cloud Foundry and we try uh, to explain that there's a paradigm shift, right? Now I have a cable car that goes from the bottom straight to the top of that mountain. It's repeatable, it's the same journey every time, right? I don't have to make those turns. I don't have to stop at that stoplight. I don't have to look both ways here or there, right? You're still gonna get the, the questions. Okay, great, they'll say, I understand you have this whole fancy thing out there, but you still have your driver's license, right? And you're gonna still obey all my rules. And you kind of give them, <laughs> no, I don't, that's not exactly what I'm talking about here. Um, so then we get into the paradigm shift and how, and how we explain this. Um, and by the way, just as encouragement, this, is, this will be, uh, if you're involved with this now, this will be a, you'll have this conversation many, many, many times and you'll win it and then you're gonna have to win it again in two weeks. And so that's the frustrated part of me, but I'm, I'm remaining hopeful here. Um, so in the old ITSM, right, change request is out of band. It's never, it's not event driven. It's, you've done a bunch of things and then you gotta generate this request. Uh, the approval, as we've talked about, it's broad and it's arbitrary. Uh, the change windows are very often coordinated and they're static, right? They're, they're either a set window you have or it's a, 
uh, unique one-time window that you set. The change is unique, non-item potent, right? So if you were to do it again, you'd have to do all this stuff again. Um, and each way, even though if it's a scripted or um, a standard change set that you have in your process, it's, it's essentially it's a unique uh, event each time. Uh, and the change validation is unique to the change type, right? So you're like, oh, I think I might have messed up group X over there, so get them in here. And the larger point here is that the, the posture is that the more times you do this, the more operational risk you're adding, right? So everybody's just terrified of you doing the process, the terrible process that they set up. Like, please don't do this. The more times you deploy, the more operational risk there are. In the new, we're saying change requests are event driven, right? They happen the moment uh, package is made, uh, perhaps, um, or w once your tests say that they can't, it can be deployed, right? It's as soon as it, as soon as it needs to. Um, the approval should be de deterministic and automated. Um, so when I was doing this change, I would, for our products, I'd look at that approval list, I'd go to each one of them and I'd say, you approve this, what do you need to know about when we're deploying this app for you to say it's good? And they're like, I don't even care. I just always hit approve. So I'm like, okay, you're out of the list. And just one by one, go down. And I honestly, in this case, found exactly zero people that cared for uh, whenever we deployed this. They had, no, they had no dependency chain to it, not a care in the world. So in their case, it's only our, in this one app's case, it's only our tests that matter. But uh, there's certainly room for external dependencies and automation that you can you weave in there, and we have that for some of our applications. But the point being, get determinism into that. Like, what is the, what needs to, to light up green for you to be happy that it can go? Uh, that change window is encapsulated in dynamic, right? So it's, since we're event driven, the deploy will happen once all the tests say is safe. And then the change window is as small as it needs to be for that change to happen. And obviously, with Cloud Foundry, we have a lot of great ways of doing zero downtime deployments, right? Change should be uniform and item potent, right? So part of this being the nature of immutable software, uh, the other part of it being that you have great pipelines. And again, change validation, we build that on into your blue-green deployment, right? So if we have some fear that production is significantly different than staging or your pre-prod environments, which in most enterprises, there's always some measure of surprise, um, you can build in all types of safety mechanisms into your blue-green deployment. Cut over traffic slowly, you know, the Netflix model, you can do canary stuff, you can, whatever you need to do in production. But the point is, I don't want anybody calling my team to say, stay up at 1 a.m. and go tell us if this is broken. We want the robots to do that. And then here, the posture is change reduces operational risk, right? So we're trying to say, the more times we do this, the better we get at it, the better our product is, the more uh, value our customers receive on time. So we're really trying to invert that, uh, that posture. So I talked a little bit about it performance being measured by KPIs. <clears throat> so there's a lot, obviously, each, you know, if you, if you kind of envision a massive pipeline, each, each job is going to have its own runtime that you're going to want those teams to be accountable to. But a macro KPI here for us is the time from the package build, so that the second something could possibly get to prod, to the time it actually lives in prod, what is the time difference between that? And on our most optimized uh, pipeline, that time is 38 minutes, right? So we set baselines for each one of these products. Um, so from the time engineer commits, all the test runs, the package is built, typically it takes about 38 minutes for that to go through all the different testing, QA, and browser tests, and API tests, and security, and performance, and, and land up in production, right? And so for us, we're like, that. that's, that's pretty darn great for us. Like 38 minutes is pretty fantastic. Um, I don't know that we can do much better than that, um, though we should try. Um, now for others, that is just mind blown. What are you doing? There's 38, when I, when I show this at our QBRs, 
there's half the room that's like, oh, I want to know how, and the other room is just like pounding their head off the desk like 38 minutes. Um, and so they're like, Kyle, why are you not, why are you not getting into the, uh, the cab meeting for this stuff? And this is actually a real life conversation I had. I am on the board, I've just haven't been in any of those meetings in a long time. Um, so th the big idea that I'm trying to get th through here, I guess, is that um, undeployed code is at best a depreciating ac asset, right? Um, every minute delay from the time it could be deployed to the time it's in production decreases the value and increases the risk. Um, you can ask any engineer, uh, would you rather fix a problem you committed 38 minutes ago or one that you worked on three months ago? If they're still working there by the time it makes production, <laughs> which we've had examples of both, right? Um, uh, it, it, so risk in that sense, from an application engineering sense, also obviously from a, from a security posture, right? So the security has done application developers the biggest favor here uh, in stories like Equifax and such that were sort of frozen uh, by change sets that were too big, they couldn't get through, couldn't update their, their, uh, their, their web stacks. And now everybody learns from that, oh, I guess it is a problem when you can't deploy at a moment's notice very quickly and safely to your environments, right? So the security story has helped us illuminate the application story here. So some takeaways here. Um, I'm, I'm asking us, us Cloud Foundry evangelists here to really embrace the paradigm shift and to not shoehorn CF in as a step forward optimization. It's a new path. So if you'll, you'll, the bait is for the legacy ops ITSM stack to just say like, hey, you're just another runtime, whatever, you know, do, do everything the same. And we have to do the hard work to communicate, communicate the paradigm shift here. Otherwise, you're not gonna reap all the benefits of the platform. Um, uh, and as, as good DevOps engineers, we need to use system thinking with the goal of continuous delivery into production as the framework through which you optimize. So if, if our, our mental framework is that pipeline from an engineer's hands into, into production, and we use system thinking about how do we optimize that whole pipeline, your considerations need to be for the performance of that entire pipeline, like that, that KPI I showed. And not just, oh, the QA guys like to work this way, and so they take the football and they run away for a week and they come back, or you know, the security guys like to do the same and performance likes to do the same, and then four weeks later we have a release. Uh, optimize uh, for continuous delivery and production. Um, and, and the truth is we're beyond rejecting the false dichotomies and onto inverse relationships, what I talked about, speed and security. So the, the, you know, the legacy mindset will be fast is reckless, and we're not just saying it's a false dichotomy, they're disconnected. We're, now we're on to actually saying, actually, there's industry proof that it's the inverse of that. Being slow is reckless, right? If it, your whole business can vanish if you can't get fixes out at a moment's notice. We gotta relentlessly hunt down ind indeterminism, right? Where it exists, where people's whims are there, where it's a phone call, where it's a meeting, where it's people's hunches and, and fears, you gotta drive that out of the room. And certainly, don't let it all into the pipeline. Um, and time to market is a KPI for every change. Minimize depreciating assets in, uh, in the form of undeployed code. Um, so, I mean, frequently we use that KPI at a business abstract layer, right? This product, this big feature but you really gotta drive that down to every change. Like how are we, are we treating every change as important to get into prod as soon as possible? Uh, champion convention rather than chastise over compliance. Um, so this is more of a, of a culture uh, awareness note um, for the two different models. Um, you know, frequently the feeling in the legacy ops and ITSM stack is that you're just getting browbeat for compliance on the process, right? Regardless of if you're like, hey, but I found a new efficiency or something like that. Um, 
So champion the convention of your pipelines, right? And like, like I was talking about, the pipelines, if it is the most efficient way, then you're just creating opportunity for applica ap application teams to leverage the most benefit, right? And like, here, if you inherit this, this convention, your life will be so much easier. And the process should serve the outcome, not the other way around. I'm, I'm really consistently amazed about how, how often you get into meetings and process is held up like this, just like unchangeable force in the room. We're the humans, we create these things, uh, we should make them do what we want. Um, and the outcomes are really an alignment opportunity. So, you know, as I engage with our ITSM um, partners, you know, I, I tell them, like, look, we want the same thing. We're gonna get there differently, and where we can align on technology, let's do it. Where we can talk together, where my robot can talk to your robot, let's do that, right? Um, but let's align on the outcomes and not, and not the how. Um, so to wrap up, I, I, I think we just really need to leverage this paradigm shift as, as Cloud Foundry enthusiasts to establish that no, new organizational value structures around the speed of delivery. Um, it's, it's gonna, it takes a lot of work, a lot of repeated work, a lot of unfun work, um, but it's necessary. Um, don't let the legacy pressure of just another runtime pull you back into the uh, land of illusion. Um, and let's, let's deliver fast, safe, and deliver value. And there's one last thing here before I close. I have change request 24, wing ding, 7968 for ending this presentation. If you could just approve that, <laughs> I'll be done. There's my contact information. If you have any questions, I will be talking with uh, the Pivotal guys on a panel about uh, platform as a product a little bit later. Um, yeah, I'll be hanging out. That's all, thanks. <laughs> <laughs>